Good morning, and welcome to this live and virtual gathering of Agora Church on this Lord's Day, Sunday, December 10th, 2023, the second Sunday of the Advent season in 2023. Let's pray together. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Lord, we're so privileged to be among the many for whom you sent your Son. We're so privileged to have received the gift of salvation through forgiveness and belief and trust in him. We pray, Lord, that because we've experienced this ministry in our lives, we would be inspired and motivated to be ministers for you to others, that they may offer the same thanks we offer this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to uh, remind you that we're just a couple weeks away from Christmas and Christmas Eve. So on Sunday, December 24th, uh, at 6.30 p.m., we will hold our community Christmas Eve service, both here live at uh, our Gore Church facility at 473 West 3rd Avenue and Oregon in Harrison West and online as well on our usual YouTube streaming channel. So that's Christmas Eve at 6.30 p.m. Our Advent lighting uh, candle today is called the Bethlehem candle. Last week we lit the prophecy candle which looks to the ministry of the prophets in encouraging people through dark times that the Messiah would come. The Bethlehem candle is, candle is about both faith and faithfulness. It focuses on the story of Joseph and Mary being driven, not just by the prophecies on the divine side, but the capricious census of the Romans on the human side, to make the journey at a time of difficulty for their family to Bethlehem to fulfill scripture and start the story of Jesus' earthly ministry. So it's then that today with the hope that faith would always be born anew in our hearts every day and faithfulness would issue from that faith that we light uh, both the prophecy candle from last week and the second candle of Advent, the Bethlehem candle. At this time, Nikki Smetters is going to come and read the scripture for the day. Uh, Mark 10, 35 through 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many.
Good morning, church. It's so good to be with you today. If you would, please join us as we sing this morning. Come behold the wondrous mystery In the dawning of the King He the theme of heaven's praises Robed in frail humanity In our longing, in our darkness now the light of life has come look to christ who condescended took on flesh to ransom us come behold the wondrous mystery he the perfect son of man in his living in his suffering never trace nor stain of sin see the true and better Adam come to save the hell-bound man Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the law in him we stand come behold the wondrous mystery Christ the Lord upon the tree in the stead of ruined sinners hangs the lamb in victory see the price of our redemption see the father's plan unfold bringing many sons to glory Grace unmeasured, love untold. Come behold the wondrous mystery. Slain by death, the God of life. But no grave could e'er restrain him. Praise the Lord, he is alive. What a foretaste of deliverance How unwavering our hope Christ in power resurrected As we will be when he comes What a foretaste of deliverance how unwavering our hope Christ in power resurrected As we will be when he comes Adore him, oh, 
Thanks so much, Josh. On this uh, Sunday where we light the Bethlehem candle, we need to remember uh, what it was like uh, for the parents of our Savior, how they found themselves homeless in a strange city, how they were dependent upon uh, the charity and generosity of others, how later they became refugees. And th this compassion for those who are without housing, thus compassion for those who find themselves refugees because of uh, political forces uh, acting far beyond their influence or control is something that's inherent in the Christian story, inherent in the Christian faith. So on this Bethlehem uh, Candle Sunday, we want to remember uh, the, those who are without housing, those who are without a home. We want to uh, think of our own city. We want to think of our state. We want to think of our nation. And we need to think around the world. There's nearly a million people homeless in Gaza. On the other side of the fence um, have friends in Israel. Uh, talked to one just a week ago along the northern border where all of the Israeli citizens and businesses have been evacuated because of a threat of Hezbollah, those who are still um, without uh, a permanent place of their own to stay uh, because of the attack. And then we can go to Africa and Asia and South America and Central America. We could just go around the world and we could find people who need our compassion, who need our prayers. It should build in our heart uh, a sense of gratitude for what we have and uh, a commitment that in what ways God calls us to serve. So let's pray and then during our congregational prayer we'll also allow some time uh, for you to lift burdens you may have uh, on your heart to the Lord. So let's pray together. Lord, on this uh, Sunday where we light the Bethlehem candle, we remember the Bethlehem story. And when we may become proud or arrogant about our faith, when we may become callous to those who are not just poor in spirit, but are poor in the wealth of the world, remind us that when you sent your son into the world, he came to a family who at that time were unhoused and homeless. Lord, we do want to uh, pray for those uh, around 
our city, pray for those within our state, pray for those in our nation facing this challenge. Uh, whatever we can do as individuals, whatever we might be able to do on a larger scale to give people a safe and comfortable and dry place to stay. We pray for places in the world. We mentioned Gaza, parts of Israel, Africa, and we, the list could get very long. We want to pray for those who are suffering, people in Ukraine. Uh, Lord, we are deeply humbled that you have been generous to grant us security, to grant us peace, to grant us resources, to grant us a roof over our heads. And we never want to take that for granted, nor do we ever want to have hearts and minds that don't turn toward those who are without. Lord, as well, there are many things going on in the lives of your people whom we call Agora Church. And so we want to pause for a moment and uh, allow each of us as we are gathered here in this moment, this moment of congregational prayer to lift our requests to you for your blessing, for you to hear, and for you to glorify yourself by answering them. Lord, thank you that you hear us, but more than that, thank you that you heed us, that your heart is inclined toward us, that when we have felt prompted by your spirit to pray, we can have confidence that you want to use our prayers to change the flow of our lives and the lives of people around us. And ultimately, in the end, to bring praise to yourself when your people say, thank you, Lord, for hearing us, for answering our prayers. May you be glorified by it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my favorite non-biblical Christmas story is a short story uh, by the author O. Henry uh, a, a story that uh, is titled The Gift of the Magi. I heard it when I was a little child, probably eight years old, and it has stuck with me year after year, decade ever, after decade say, uh, since, and it is still one of my favorites. If you've ever read this story, it's the story of a very young couple who live in an $8 a week apartment in New York in the 1920s. They have two prized possessions. They have very little, but uh, in this new marriage, they have two prized possessions. The one possession is a gold watch that Jim has, and the other is long, luxurious hair nearly ankle-length hair that Della has. In sheer irony in the story, one Christmas season, Jim sells his watch to purchase a set of silver combs for Della's hair. At the same time, Della sells her hair to purchase a beautiful chain for his watch. O. Henry ends the story with uh, this paragraph, and it's one that is intended to make us think. The Magi, as you know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men who brought gifts to the newborn Christ child. They were the first to give Christmas gifts. Being wise, their gifts were doubtless wise ones. And here I have told you the story of two children who were not wise. Each sold the most valuable thing he owned in order 
to buy a gift for the other. But let me speak a last word to the wise of these days. Of all who give gifts, these two were the most wise. Of all who give and receive gifts, such as they are, are the most wise. Everywhere, they are the wise ones. They are the magi. Missionary Jim Elliott wrote uh, these words not long uh, before he departed for the Amazon jungle in which he died doing missionary work. He wrote, He is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Service and sacrifice are eternally part of the Christmas story. There are so many elements that touch our daily lives that in the short narratives of Christmas emerge. The Christmas story calls for us to be compassion to those who are unhoused. The Christmas story calls us to service and sacrifice. There are many ways to look at the Christmas event from the perspective of earth, from the perspective of heaven, through the eyes of Christ's enemies or through the eyes of his waiting faithful people. We can look at the how of it. We can look at the why of it. So in this Advent season, what we have chosen to do is for the four Sundays of Advent, we're taking the four perspectives of the Gospels and looking at the Christmas event, looking at each Gospel. The first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called the synoptic Gospels because of the similarity of their perspective. I like to think of them as different camera angles, that God had the story of his Messiah to tell, and Christ on the earth was such an overwhelming presence and truth and revelation that God set up the four cameras of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all from different perspectives. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all on trolleys on the ground looking at it from differing angles. John will come along later and be on the crane above looking down, maybe with the, in modern days, the drone shot looking at it. But when we put them all together, we begin to have not maybe a complete picture, but a sufficient picture of who the Son of God was as he came and eternally took on human nature, flesh, and formed. Last week we looked at Matthew as he uh, presented Christ as the King of the Jews. And as King of the Jews and also the rightful heir of the kingdom of heaven, he calls each of us to surrender to him, to be his follower. This week, we're going to look at Mark's presentation because Mark presents Christ as the perfect servant, the perfect servant. It's not easy to find Christmas in the Gospel of Mark. If you come to the Gospel of Matthew, before you get out of the first chapter, you're digging into the Christmas story. And you go to the Gospel of Luke and the Christmas story is set up in chapter 1 and unfolding in chapter 2. When we come to Mark, Mark, because he wants to describe Christ as the perfect servant, just takes off with John the Baptist ministering right away. We're in the middle of John the Baptist ministering and before we get out of the first chapter of Mark, Jesus is performing miracles in his earthly ministry. Now, the reason for this is that Mark was written to a Roman audience. Mark uh, has a Roman name. Marcus is not a Jewish name. It's a Roman Latin name. Uh, we find out that his mother was Jewish, which probably indicates to us that his father was a Roman, perhaps a soldier or a businessman working, a government official working in Jerusalem, met a Jewish woman, and they were married, and then Mark was uh, the child of that uh, union. So he lived in both worlds. He understood the Jewish world. 
He was waiting for the Messiah. He also understood the Roman world. And the Romans were, I like to think of the Romans as the Germans of the ancient world. They prized above all things efficiency and effectiveness. How do you do it? They didn't care as much as maybe the Greeks or the Jews might about the ethics, the morality, the uh, why, the philosophy of it all. They wanted to know, does this work? Does this achieve our goals? Is this effective? Is this efficient? And so their perspective of what did Jesus do? What did he accomplish? What was his value? In some ways, it's not until Mark chapter 10 in the passage we just read that we encounter what Christmas because there it says, right, Christmas is about the Son of God coming to earth. There it says this, verse 45, even the Son of Man did not come. That's Christmas, right? He came to earth, what? Not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. We come to the Gospel of Mark and we're going to see Jesus as God's man of action, healing people, teaching, leading, discipling, confronting, active, active, active. And as we think about how that might apply to us, it will raise questions about the intents of our heart in the Christmas season. In one succinct verse, Mark gives us the why of the Christmas story, that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life. It wasn't to create a holiday, though the coming of Christ to the earth did that. It wasn't to inspire giving, though it has done that. It wasn't to spread goodwill among all peoples of the world, though it has provided the basis for doing that. Jesus came to serve and to sacrifice. And because of him, service and sacrifice are eternally part of the Christmas story. I've placed in your message notes then two questions I'd like to talk about today. And they're two questions that the example of Jesus Christ inspires us to ask in this or any Christmas season. The first question I'll take from the first part of Mark chapter 10, verse 45, the, the key verse, some people would say, of the whole book of Mark, but certainly the key Christmas verse. And that is this question. Do I focus on serving others or expecting others to serve me? We're not asking what you do, right? We're not asking whether you serve others. We're asking you what you focus on, whether you have a focus on serving others. I've known lots of people through the years in the church that do lots of things, that serve lots of people. But when you hear them, they often are feeling slighted because nobody thanked them. They're feeling wounded because nobody appreciated them or nobody listened to them. And if you listen long enough, you realize that the focus of their service is to receive attention and affirmation. It is, in some way, selfless serving. It's good that people are getting served, but it's not service that flows out of a heart of service, a focus on service. There are plenty of people then in the Christian faith also who don't serve at all because they're waiting for their quid pro quo. They're waiting for someone to serve them enough before they serve others. Christ showed that he had a focus on serving others and not expecting others to serve him. That's the first part of what it says here, right? He, he came, there's Christmas, not to be served, but to serve. 
But this service, as we'll talk about in our second point a lot, is tough and difficult. And it raises the question, how do you sustain it? And so at the bottom of your message notes, I've listed five keys to sustainable service to others. Five keys. And I'll just quickly go over these. But we're calling you to service by Jesus' example. We should give you some help and cert. So it's easier to sustain focusing on others if you find your identity in being a servant, if you find meaning in giving to others. That's the whole point of O. Henry's story, right? We fall in love with Jim and Della because they're the kind of people that would, Jim would sell the watch that was his most precious possession to give Della a gift that connected to her most precious possession, her hair. Della would sell her very own hair, would, would sell a part of herself to give Jim a gift that was meaningful. They, they found their identity not in what they were going to get from the other one, but what they were going to give to the other one. I didn't read the whole story, but when you read it and they find out the irony of their choices, there's no frustration, there's no bitterness, there's no anger. In fact, their hearts are lifted to a higher level of Christmas celebration. They enjoy each other all the more because it's not the things of Christmas, but the people, the family, family of God, friends, our family of origin, our own household and family. It's, those are the things that matter the most, and they're not really things at all. So if you want to do sustainable service to others, Find your identity in giving, not getting, in being a servant. The second thing is, if you want to be sustainable, you have to pay a little bit of attention to identify the givers and takers in your life and avoid spending all your time with either category. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25, it says this, A generous person will prosper. Whoever gives to others and refreshes them will be refreshed themselves. So there's a principle. If you are a giver, there will be the people to whom you give who reciprocate and give back. It'll be sustainable. And so those are the givers in your life. And you want to meet them and spend time with them and share with them and invest in them and they'll invest in you. It's a wonderful thing. There are also, though, those who can't do that. In uh, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 15, we are warned by the writer of Proverbs, there are two, there are things that are never satisfied, like the leech that always says, give, give. God has called us as we journey through life, not just to give to those who give back, but to also give to those who who take and never say thank you. But the wisdom of the Bible, when we expand it out, realizes you have to balance that. Don't get yourself sunk in and totally invested with people that can do nothing but drain you. But don't run away from them and be afraid of them. Have your life balanced between givers and takers, those who can be reciprocal and those who can't. That will help you be sustainable in God's call of serving others. A third thing is to renew your heart and mind through dependence upon God in prayer. Don't try to do this yourself. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, it probably is what is one of the lowest points of David's life where he's exiled from the people of God. He's serving as a, miss, a mercenary among the Philistines. They reject him and send him back to his base of operation where his family and the family of his soldiers are, Ziklag. And when he gets back there, that city has been attacked by uh, a, a tribe of bandits and their wealth and their families and uh, herds have all been carried off. What a, what a terrible, kicked out of your own country, 
rejected by the people you've been serving and fighting and risking your life with, then to come home and find somebody's come in, come in and kidnapped your, your wife, your children, the families of your soldiers. And in first Sam, at that, that terribly low moment, in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6, it says that this, that David renewed himself in the Lord. He strengthened himself in the Lord. If we want to sustain serving others, we have to have a dependence upon God and prayer. We have to do it out of faith. We have to be trusting not our gifts, capacities, energy, and reserve, but the Lord. A fourth key to uh, sustainably serving others uh, is to focus on serving God by serving others, looking solely for his pleasure and not the gratitude of others. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6, it's only been a couple of weeks that we were there, we're told to, uh, servants are told to serve their masters not as men pleasers, but as if they were serving God. I tell you, all of us as human beings, have a propensity to be ungrateful, to take generosity for granted, whether it's from God or from people in our lives. It's, it's a sad part of the human condition that we tend to take things for granted. And when you realize that about yourself, you can see it in other people. And some people are so broken, so wounded by the things they've been through or even the choices they've made that they can't even form the words, thank you. To thank someone else, to appreciate someone else is to make themselves vulnerable. And it would be to lower those walls for a moment and they can't do it. They can't say, I'm sorry. They can't say, I was wrong. Sometimes they can't say, I love you. God would say, don't focus on what they say back to you. Don't focus on who you're serving. Focus that the service is a service to me. It's a spiritual act of worship. Then finally, a fifth thing is, uh, uh, God is not a slave driver, right? Sometimes the church likes to present him that way, that he never has enough from you, that, you know, through various times of Christianity, it served the institutions of Christianity to say, God wants all of it, all the time, all to the limit. But it's not true. God wants there to be rhythms in our lives, rhythms of service and rhythms of rest and rhythms of recreation. And so always remember, don't get yourself in a position where the rhythm of rest can't be part of what you do. Uh, you, can, you might even be somebody who's a full-time caretaker. Even with God's help, you can't sustain that without the rhythm of reflection, the rhythm of rest fitting into that very highly demanding uh, necessity requirement of service. So those are five keys to sustainable service. When we say, do I focus, focus on serving others or expect others to serve me? Those are five things that can help us do it. All practical things from uh, the Bible. The second question, though, I want the example of Jesus to raise for us is this. Do I give from my life and not just from my wallet. What was the first part of this key verse? It was, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. His focus was on serving others. And then there's the second part, and to give what his life, a ransom for many. Biblical Christianity, like God, cannot be domesticated. You, I can give you ideas of how to make service sustainable, but I can't keep it from at times needing to be sacrificial. I can mention that person whose calling is to be a full-time caregiver in a very demanding 
and draining situation, and I can suggest to sustain it, they need to call upon God and probably partner with other people and have rhythms of rest. But in the end, at some point, that will take something, like Della's hair, right? It'll take something from the person themselves. And it'll take time, just like Della's hair took time, it'll take time for uh, that maybe to be renewed after such a, a sacrifice. Here in the Christmas story is the message that at times, not all the time to 100% of a degree so that we are constantly living a life of martyrdom, no, but at times we will be called to sacrifice, to give up some of ourself, right? That's what sacrifice is. It is to give up something, to take from our time, to take from our emotions, to take from our energy, not just our wallet, but to take from us and to give up to God service to someone else. If our Lord couldn't escape that reality of ministry, how can we, we uh, do or expect anything else? There will be at those times, and we'll need those same principles of dependence upon God, of having uh, rhythms in our life, and, and paying attention to our focus and our identity. In our world today, it's all too easy to give from our check put, to give from our wallet, and never get down to giving from our lives. But that's what makes us like Jesus, as Mark describes him as the perfect servant, and us as reflections of who he is. Let's pray together. Lord, we pray to you, you would help us to be givers and not takers in this season when we remember you. You who came to earth not to be served, but to serve. And also, not just to give from your wallet, but to give from your life. Thank you for that example. We have to depend upon you to be able to do that as you want us to. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless and thank you for joining us today.